click the bell icon to get latest videos from Ikeda. Hello friends, in today's session we are going to study all the methods of preparations of carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes or CNPs as we call them are nanomaterials. They are made up of carbon completely. There are hexagonal shapes of carbon which are two dimensional structures. In today's session we will see all the important methods of preparation of carbon nanotubes. <music> Methods of preparation of CNTs. CNTs are nothing but carbon nanotubes. So whenever we are talking about carbon nanotubes, we will actually see hexagonal structures over here. And these hexagonal structures are connected to each other. And they will form long sheets. So there will be long sheets of carbon hexagonal structures. And we roll these sheets into tubes. These tubes are nothing but my carbon nanotubes. Now when I am talking about these hexagonal structures, all these corners or points or vertexes are made up of carbons and there will be carbon to carbon links everywhere. That means my carbon nanotube is entirely made up of carbons. There are five methods of preparation of carbon nanotubes and fullerenes. Now what exactly are fullerenes? Fullerenes are also known as Buckminster's ball that is C60. There are total 60 carbons in a fullerene and all of them are connected in a form of a sphere. So over here I have sphere and there are carbons inside it. And these carbons are all connected forming a sphere and this sphere is known as fullerene. In short fullerene is nothing but carbon sphere containing 60 carbons. So whenever I want to make a carbon nanotube or a fullerene, I have total 5 methods for preparing it. The first is the arc method. The second is the laser method, the third is the chemical vapor deposition method, the fourth is ball milling and the fifth one is flame synthesis. Out of all these five methods, the most important ones are the laser method and the chemical vapor deposition. Let us see them in detail. The most commonly used methods are laser method and CVD. So the first method we will see is the laser method. In this method, the samples were prepared by laser vaporization of graphite rods. So now what exactly is a graphite rod? Whenever I imagine a graphite rod, graphite rod is entirely made up of carbon. So again, there are hexagonal rings over here. And there are layers of hexagonal rings. So for example, I have the first layer of hexagonal rings. This layer is entirely made up of carbon. So this carbon on all the vertexes. Graphite entirely contains carbon and no other element. There is another layer of hexagonal rings down. And both of these layers are joined together by weak forces known as van der Waal forces. This is my graphite structure. So they take this entire structure in the form of a rod with a 1 is to 1 catalyst mixture of cobalt and nickel at 1200 degrees celsius in flowing argon followed by heat treatment in a vacuum at 1000 degrees celsius to get C60 now what is C60 fullerene and other types of fullerene so if I want to make a carbon nanotube we know that carbon nanotubes are entirely completely made up of carbons over here we know that fullerenes are made up of C60 that means this is also entirely made up of carbon. The material which I need to use or the raw materials to make fullerene which is C60 or carbon nanotubes which are entirely made up of carbons has to be only carbon and that is the reason why we take graphite. Graphite is a substance which has layers. The first layer contains hexagonal rings and these hexagonal rings are made up of carbon as shown over here. The second layer above here is also made up of hexagonal rings and all these hexagonal rings also contain carbons. That means the entire graphite rod is only made up of carbons. Now both these layers are joined together or connected by weak forces known as van der Waal forces. Now these van der Waal forces are these forces which are shown over here. So when we take this in a proportion of 1 is to 1 catalyst mixture of cobalt and nickel that means cobalt will be 1 and nickel 
will also be 1. That means 1 is to 1. So if I am taking cobalt 50 ml, nickel will also be 50 ml. If I am taking cobalt as 5 ml, nickel will also be 5 ml. That is the meaning of 1 is to 1 mixture. So 1 is to 1 mixture of catalyst of cobalt or nickel. And I heat this graphite to 1200 degrees Celsius. While heating it to 1200 degrees Celsius, we understand that all these bonds are strong. These carbon-carbon bonds are all covalent bonds and covalent bonds are strong. The only weak bonds which are present in graphite are these bonds which are weak van der Waals forces. So when you heat it in presence of catalyst or give any other type of physical pressure to it, the bonds which will break are the van der Waals forces and not the covalent bonds between the carbons because those are strong bonds. In flowing argon, followed by heat treatment in a vacuum at 1000 degrees Celsius, when we reheat it again to 1000 degrees Celsius, what happens is these bonds will break at 1200 degrees Celsius and now reheating that in 1000 degrees Celsius will reshape these bonds and then what we'll get is C60 which are fullerenes. This graphite will turn into a fullerene that means layers of carbon will eventually turn into sphere of carbon of 60 carbons known as fullerene. Now this entire reaction also has certain byproducts. Every reaction in chemistry has certain byproducts. The number of carbons present in graphite cannot be exactly equal to the number of carbons which will be in fullerene. That means if there are certain extra carbons, the carbons always have to be extra. If I need 60 carbons for making a fullerene and I just have 50 carbons in my reactant, the main product of fullerene will not be produced at all. And that is the reason why on my reactant side there has to be more number of carbons than needed for making a fullerene. So now for example in my reactant side I take more amount of graphite containing more number of carbons. So I have total 70 carbons in my reactant side in the form of graphite. Out of those 70 carbons 60 of them are being used in making the sphere of C60 which is known as fullerene. Now 10 carbons are remaining. These 10 carbons will form the byproduct. And a byproduct is nothing but soot. So the use of two successive layer pulses minimizes the amount of carbon deposited as soot. We need to understand that we do not want a lot of soot because soot is a kind of impurity created by carbon and it also leads to pollution. And that is the reason why we need to minimize the amount of soot. Thus, two successive laser pulses will help in minimizing the amount of soot. The second laser pulse breaks up the layer particles ablated by the first one and feeds them into the growing nanotube structure. Now fullerenes and nanotubes both of them can be made by the same intention or by the same process. So over here instead of fullerene I can also make a nanotube. For nanotube I will just need long sheets of carbons which are hexagonal and these sheets have to be rolled up in the form of a tube. This is nothing but a carbon nanotube. Now when you see graphite, graphite is also layers of sheets of carbon but the layers are connected by van der Waal forces. We first need to break those van der Waal forces, get those layers together, form long sheets of that and then roll them into a carbon nanotube. The material produced by this method appears as a mat of ropes that is 10 to 20 nanometer in diameter and up to 100 mu m or more in length. Each rope is found to consist primarily of a bundle of single wall nanotubes aligned with a common axis. So if I have a nanotube over here, this nanotube will have a common axis to which it will be aligned with. Let us see the drawbacks of the laser method. This method involves evaporating the carbon source, hence to increase the production to the industrial level using this approach is difficult. Now when we recall this entire method, the first thing we do is we heat it to 1200 degrees Celsius. The second thing we do is heat it to 1000 degrees Celsius. That means first I'll have to provide heat to the carbon up to 1200 degrees Celsius in presence of flowing argon. And next I'll have to provide heat at 1000 degrees Celsius. Now both these processes cannot be merged together. That means I cannot just add up both these values and give that amount of heat. I first have to give only 1200, then let it cool down and then heat it to 1000 and then again cool down. And this process may be a little difficult for a huge number of carbons at an industrial level. The carbon nanotubes produced by these methods are in tangled form. Now what exactly is tangled form? 
whenever I talk about carbon nanotubes, carbon nanotubes are nothing but sheets of carbon, but those sheets contain hexagonal structures of carbon. So if at all I have this entire sheet of carbon, this sheet will contain all these hexagonal structures and these hexagonal structures will have carbons at the vertex. Now if these carbons are not at the vertex but they are just tangled then it may not be considered as a carbon nanotube. So if you see this form over here this is a tangled form and that is the reason why we do not appreciate it. For carbon nanotubes there have to be hexagonal loops inside the entire sheet and that sheet can be rolled up into a carbon nanotube. Mixed with unwanted forms of carbon and the other metal species. Now again unwanted forms of carbon is fine. We can try to rearrange these carbons. But again there are certain metal species which are also present over here. Now which metal species can come over here? The catalysts. We had cobalt and nickel at 1 is to 1. Now these can come and interfere inside this sheet of your and there can be other species of elements as well. Hence, CNTs produced are difficult to purify, manipulate and assemble for building nanotube device architectures for practical application. If these carbons are tangled and if there are other species present in it, we cannot purify it or manipulate it in any way for building the nanotube device or the entire carbon nanotube. The next method is chemical vapor deposition method. In this method hydrocarbons. Now what exactly are hydrocarbons? Hydrocarbons are organic materials. They contain only two things hydrogen and carbon. So if I have a chain of carbon and hydrogen I will call it hydrocarbon. Now the major components over here should be carbon attached with hydrogen. Apart from carbon and hydrogen there can be some amount of other elements as well. There can be some amounts of oxygen or there can be some amounts of sulfur in it or nitrogen in it as well. But the main component over here should be carbon and hydrogen. These compounds are known as hydrocarbons. The entire organic chemistry is based only on hydrocarbons. Such as acetylene. So what exactly is acetylene? Acetylene is nothing but a carbon with another carbon and three bonds are given to each other. Now when we talk about carbon, carbon has a valency of four. Carbon can make four bonds. Now it can make these four bonds with each other or with other substances as well. When I talk about other substances, I'm talking about other elements. In hydrocarbons, the carbon makes bond with itself. That means it will make a bond with another carbon and it will make bonds with hydrogen. So out of those four bonds, this first carbon has made three bonds with this second carbon. The maximum number of bonds a carbon can make with another carbon is 3. So carbon can make one bond with another carbon or two bonds with another carbon or three bonds with another carbon. One bond is known as alkanes, two bonds is known as alkenes and three bond is known as alkynes. Acetylene is an alkyne because one carbon is making three bonds with another carbon. So out of the four bonds, three bonds are made by this carbon to this carbon. The only valency left or the number of bonds left is one and that fourth bond will be made with hydrogen. Similarly when I'm talking about this carbon, this carbon also has a valency of four. This carbon can also make four bonds. Out of these four bonds it chooses and decides to make three bonds with the another carbon. So this carbon is also making three bonds with this carbon. The only bond left is the fourth bond. And so it makes the fourth bond over here with hydrogen. When I see the molecular formula of it, I find two carbons and two hydrogens. C2H2 is nothing but acetylene. It is subjected to chemical vapor deposition catalytically using metal catalyst such as cobalt or ion. So this acetylene, now again it contains carbon and hydrogens. The main component over here is carbon. That is the reason why we can break the double bond and the triple bond and only keep the single bond and try making the carbon hexagonal shape with it and make entire sheets out of it to form carbon nanotubes. Hydrocarbons use are acetylene. Acetylene is nothing but C, triple bond C and methane. Now what exactly is methane over here? Carbon has a valency of 4 that means it will make 4 bonds. So I am just making 4 bonds over here. And all these four bonds of methane are being connected to hydrogen. There is no other carbon in it. 
So when I see the molecular formula of it, it will be CH4. This CH4 is nothing but methane. So acetylene and methane can be used for chemical vapor deposition for making carbon nanotubes. So here in today's session, we studied the methods of preparation of CNTs, which is carbon nanotubes. There were five methods, but two of them were extremely important. The first one was the laser method, and the second one was the chemical vapor deposition, CVD method. We studied both the methods in detail, and we also studied the drawbacks of it. Thank you so much for watching this video. Stay tuned to Ikira and subscribe to Ikira.